first speaker today is the Director of Small and Medium Business for Mi Markets for Microsoft in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, so essentially, if you think about automation, initially when we automated products and services, um, we tended to apply automations to a process, right? You had a, a process and you would automate a simple process. Well, as businesses uh, have evolved and automation has become far more sophisticated, we're now having to look at the underlying processes and not, not and the people and, and systems, not just automating exactly the same process that was there before, so that we can apply automation techniques in a much more creative way. So, to, uh, um, w ha talking about an exploration of innovation, how the triangle of purpose, creativity, and artificial intelligence allows us to achieve more. Please give an incredible, warm round of applause to Erwin Hartenberg. <laughs> warm round of applause. Woohoo! Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. I'm happy I, I don't have to do all the warm-up uh, work because that definitely is uh, not my strength. Uh, so very happy to be here this morning. Uh, amazing uh, to be able to share some stories with you, uh, with you this morning. We're going to do um, a bit of an exploration today. We'll talk about a lot of different things. We'll talk about tennis, um, we'll talk about cooking, um, and we'll talk about artificial intelligence um, as well. But I want to start with uh, taking you back uh, a little bit. Uh, and I, I noticed part of the audience is relatively young, um, but let's imagine the 70s. Um, I'm happy I don't, I don't live in that age, because with my hairdo, that obviously wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be very successful. But um, back in the day, we had photography, right? Um, now I'm a big photography fan. I really like photography. Uh, but in the 70s, um, photography obviously was chemical-based, right? You took uh, a photo, you captured the light that came in, and through a chemical process, that light was transferred onto film, and voila, you had uh, an image. And the fastest camera that would do that process from taking the photo all the way down to having the result, having a picture, was, of course, the famous, the famous Polaroid. And that took about 30 to 40 seconds to complete. Take a photo, 30, 40 seconds later, you would have the image. And that was really quite amazing. And at the same time, um, for instance, another thing from the 70s is a classic car here like the Volvo. This is a Volvo 240. And as you know, Volvo made cars, still makes cars. They've changed a little bit. But they made cars with the intent of making the safest car on the planet. That was the purpose of the Volvo Corporation. They wanted to make sure that everything was safe. They introduced the seat belt, they introduced a ton of safety features that are common in every car today. But imagine what would have happened back in the 70s if some guy or girl with long hair, more likely um, uh, the girl with long hair, but it's the 70s, so you never know, uh, would go to Volvo and would go to the engineers or the board of directors and say, I'm going to make your car even safer by using a Polaroid camera. That's going to be the game changer for, for, for road safety. And you can imagine that at that time, the board of directors or the engineers would go like, what? Uh, what, what do you want to do? You want to strap a Polaroid on the corner of our cars and then take pictures all the time? That doesn't make any sense. And yet, here we are, right? It's, of course, time has passed, but if you look at kind of what's going on today, you see that that is exactly what is happening today when you look at uh, self-driving cars, autonomous driving cars. And not just autonomous cars, but also the safety features that you have in human-driven cars where the camera actually helps the car be more successful, be more safe. And what you see here is an example of uh, some of that imagery in working where because photography, because image taking is now digital and we can go from the moment where we can actually see the light instantaneously into putting that into a picture. And we can power that now with artificial intelligence to do object recognition so we can see everything on the road and you can see kind of how, uh, how the camera is picking up all of the objects on the road here. And this is exactly why artificial intelligence makes such a difference because it takes a relatively ordinary process like photography but with artificial intelligence, you can turn that into a whole different thing. And right now, that's exactly it. This is one of the main reasons why we're almost getting to a point where self-driving cars, autonomous cars, are a reality. And, and, and they're already assisting you in your, in your everyday car as well. So that's really kind of why this change with artificial intelligence is so incredibly important. And the way I always like to think about 
technology and the role that it plays in our lives um, is some kind of a dance. Now, I'm not a very great, uh, great dancer. Um, uh, my wife uh, loves dancing and uh, I do dancing as well. I'm not very good at it. But I do get the concept of, um, of a leader and a follower, right? As a leader, you basically set the tone. There's, of course, the music, but you as a leader kind of decide what happens. And when I think about kind of the dynamic between human needs or human purpose or, or the purpose of an organization and technology, it's kind of that cycle where the human need kind of influences technology to be able to fulfill that need. And that's kind of the normal way of things. So there's a leader, the human need, and then the technology follows to be able to fill that out. But there are certain waves of technology innovation that actually reverse the roles. And I think right now we're, we're, we're entering a stage where it's not just the way that the arrow flows from the need to technology, but technology is actually influencing our idea of a need at the same time. So basically the, there is a role reversal happening here where both the human need and technology are taking turns in leading the dance, so to speak. And when these two things come together, magic happens and that's when progress is being made. And we're right now at a point in time where that arrow is really, really incredibly powerful. The arrow that goes from technology into need because it allows us to rethink how we've built our, uh, our design, how we've built our processes, how we built the world that we built for, uh, for our, uh, our citizens and so on. And therefore, it's all the more important to really think about if you can do the same thing with that example with, with photography, right? And you can use AI and turn it into a whole new thing. It's very important to not just look at the technology, but it's important to look at the purpose of your organization. What are you out here to do? Are you here to provide, um, like I said, Volvo as an example, the safest car on the planet? That's a very clear purpose. And that means that you can look at technology that way and see what possibilities there are to actually get better at doing that. And sometimes when we think about technology, when we think about how we do our everyday work, we kind of forget about our purpose. Um, but it's actually really important because, as I'll, as I'll show you today, you need to start thinking about redesigning the way you've set up your organization, the way you've set up your company, or if you're a government entity. And it all goes back to that purpose. But before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about why we talk so much about AI today. Right? AI is not a necessarily new concept when you think about the, uh, the history of, uh, of AI. When we came out of World War II, there was actually a lot of work being done on, uh, on AI. And for instance, Turing, uh, famous from also uh, cracking the, uh, the, the Nazi code, the Enigma code, um, put a lot of effort in, and he's also famous for the Turing test, which was kind of a, a conceptual framework of how we could get, how you could detect if, uh, if a computer would be able to have a conversation at the human level. Um, so there's been a lot of work in there, a lot of theoretical work through the 50s and 60s in, in AI as a concept. Um, but then it kind of went away simply because all of those concepts were not able to really be powered by a powerful enough computing platform. So it kind of left and people didn't really do, do anything with AI anymore and became what we call the AI winter. And then when the cloud happened back in you know, 2008, 2009, that really started to kick off, all of a sudden we had this idea of limitless computing power. Um, and we had all of these other technology advancements here. And that kind of brought back to life the idea of AI and what it could do for us. And we've seen that acceleration go ever since. So we like to think that we're now coming out of the AI winter, which was like the, the period of um, uh, after the late... Um, the late 60s, and now we're heading into spring and we're seeing all these things blossom and come out of the ground and all these amazing things are starting to take, uh, to take place. And the reason why is twofold. Um, there's a technology element and there is, an, let's say, a human idea or, or an organizational element to it as well. One of the things that uh, was already mentioned before is if you look at kind of the, the way technology has been applied, it's kind of didn't really change the underlying process. So the first stage, um, when you think about the way technology has impacted uh, processes, digitization, is where we took content, paper content, all kind of content. You remember these old machines with these stamp cards and all that kind of stuff, and we made it digital. But we didn't really change the process. We just made it more efficient to work with content, to create content, share content. But the process itself kind of stayed the same. The second step is where we automated the process. Uh, we created a lot of automation. And when you think about it, every organization essentially is a collection of processes. Like all the organizations in the world are nothing more than a bunch of people coming together and agreeing on a couple of processes, right? So how do you sign up a new customer? How do you uh, fill out a form? How do you enter a hospital? They're all steps. And they're all 
if this happens, then that should happen, kind of deterministic processes. And again, the processes themselves didn't really change. But now, with technology like AI, we're moving away from a if this, then that kind of thing, but we're moving into a, into a state where it's much more about this is likely to happen. What should we do with that? There is a high probability that this is the case. And we have a much more forward-looking, fluid view of a whole range of possibilities, and that means a static if this, then that process. That doesn't work anymore, so we need to rethink how we do that. And this is on everybody's mind, right? I mean, we did a lot of research with our customers uh, for Microsoft in, uh, in 2018. And 61% of them said, yeah, we really expect disruption in our industry over the next couple of years or so. Uh, and they thought, hey, we could be disrupted, but maybe we will also be the disruptor. But it's on everybody's mind. And everybody has this feeling that something is, is definitely about to happen. And with AI, what's funny is that AI is not binary. What I mean with that is it's not like, it's not like you do kind of a technology migration, like a new version of something, or you kind of flip a switch, and there we had no AI, and now we have AI, and, and we move on with our lives. That's not how it works. AI is very much a ongoing process. And also, when you start working with AI, and I'll give you some examples of that later, you need to keep doing that all the time. So you need to continuously improve the way the technology is kind of reading your world, reading your models, reading your data. And these things change, so you're constantly learning here. And AI is already everywhere. I mean, if you look, think about the recommendations that you get from your, um, uh, from your app for music, for instance, that's AI right there. If you've ever, ever been called by your bank uh, who told you, like, hey, we think there's been fraud with your credit card, so we took some measures, that's AI right there. AI is really good at pattern detection. So AI is already everywhere. But the foundation for AI really is three things. This, this whole kind of changing technology that has made it, made it uh, possible for us to come out of that AI winter and now go into that AI spring. And first of all, that's data. And I think there's a lot of talk about uh, at this conference as well about what you can do with data. But the fact that we've got so many data generating elements in our society today, that creates a whole new digital view of what we can do. Uh, and without that data, AI simply doesn't work. And I'll show you, show you that. The other one is cloud, right? You can't do AI if you don't have the enormous computing power that is now available and is actually available against uh, a really low entry point, a low price point for, uh, for everybody, whether it's us or whether it's our competitors. Cloud availability makes AI possible. Technically, you can do AI if you do that on your own, but that's really, really expensive and really hard to do. And finally, we've made a number of progresses when it comes to the modeling. So interpreting different ways of data and, and building a self-learning system that has, has allowed us to actually turn all of that data, which for us humans is impossible to actually put to good use, but with the right models and the right algorithms, we can actually do that. So those three things are powering AI. And, and again, why are we talking about AI so much? Well, if you look at some of the progress, and these are just some examples of, of, of the research that we've done, and again, there's many other uh, players out there as well, but you see kind of where we are already at human parity or already beyond. And that's happened in the last, let's say, two, three, four years, where whether it's object recognition, speech recognition, machine translation, all those things are now operating at a human level. And one of the funny things about AI is as well, is that for, for decades, and you would all know this, like you've learned how to talk to or with a computer, right? The way that we've automated our stuff meant that you have had to learn whether you're a programmer, that makes sense that you really have to kind of build at the core of technology. But even if you're, if you're working uh, um, with a, a word processor or you're working uh, with, with any other forms-based application, you had to stick within this particular box because if you went outside of the box, the computer wouldn't understand you. So we've had to learn, in a way, how to communicate with a computer on the terms of the computer. And right now with AI, that's going the other way around. So the computer, because of all of these things, is actually learning to talk like a human being. And we can have a human conversation with a computer. And that makes actually computing much more accessible and much more interesting going forward. And you see applications of AI already happening everywhere. And here's one example from one of our customers in, uh, in Hungary. It's Vaberer. It's a logistics company. And a point I'm going to make today is that when you haven't started thinking about AI, how you can apply it for your organization, one of the best ways to do that is actually to start small. Start actually lower than the capacity that you can already do. 
Um, and the reason why is that that will give you a lot of confidence and learnings early on, and you can scale that. And this is an example where this has not been a redesign of the process. They simply used AI to dramatically improve the, the load distribution of their, of their trucks, of their fleet, to have a, a, a number of, I think it was 92% or so, uh, which is dramatic improvement. But the process itself is relatively the same. But having now this experience with AI is going to allow them to kind of take that to the next step. So let's talk a little bit about what AI is, because we talk a lot about AI. We, as Microsoft, do that a lot as well, but we don't always take the time and say, like, so what does that actually mean, right? What does that mean in, in human, uh, human language? And when you think about it, there's basically two things that really kind of build up an AI system. There is narrow AI, which is a kind of um, a very specific application almost of the underlying technology, which is all about that speech recognition thing that I said before. And it, it's basically how we can now mimic our human cognitive functions that allow us to talk to computers, share visuals with computers, and basically let those computers talk to us in a human way. And the other one is actually the thing that powers all of that. And that is the ability for systems to learn by themselves. The, the ability to take data and to make sense of that data all by themselves without us as humans telling them what that data is all about. And those really are the two things, and we call that machine learning, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit in, uh, later. But the fact that AI is already everywhere, um, I could tell you that, but it's probably a better idea to just give you a few examples in a, in a short video. So let's, uh, let's look at the video. Artificial intelligence isn't coming. It's here. It's the defining technology of our time. But it's human ingenuity that makes it so powerful. Jane started losing her vision when she was 12. California Street. She uses seeing AI. I crept down the, I stairs, crept and down the, the stairs and out the door which enables her to read and navigate her world. Microsoft AI is helping farmers adapt to climate change. We can use technology to help feed the world without wrecking the planet. Enabling wildlife conservation. The ability to use AI really democratizes science. WildMe uses images from any source to help study endangered species. And creating new ways for people with hearing loss to communicate. I want the exact same information that my hearing friends have. It's more than just imitating intelligence or sounding like a human. Microsoft AI is changing every industry, from healthcare. And now you can see these finite details, the relationship with many structures. To engineering. And telecommunications. We are using artificial intelligence to change the way we are relating to customers. AI lets us put people first. The Microsoft tools really enabled us to breathe digital life into an iconic brand persona. The product that we make is not a thing in a box. Mm. Microsoft AI empowers others to create experiences and potential. This is just the beginning. Artificial intelligence, it's just opened up this whole world. The future we invent is a choice we make. So what I like about the examples here is and one of the people from, I think, Telefonica said it themselves, AI actually allows us to do things much more people-like. So you see some of those examples, and you see that the way they're interacting with technology is much more human-like. It's not sitting down in front of a, a spreadsheet and cracking down numbers. No, it's a very human way of being able to access information uh, and do something with that. But let's, again, unpack that one step further. I'm not going to show you all kinds of uh, uh, fuzzy uh, uh, technology uh, today. But one thing is, is, I think, a good thing to remember how AI does what it does. Because the better you know that, the better you can think about how you would actually apply that in your organization. And think about if you were to build a system, and you want to build a system that is able to make, see the difference between a wolf and a dog. And if you do that in a classical linear flow, the deterministic flow, you would need to basically tell the system about every single dog species that is out there. So you would have to explain to them, this is a Doberman, this is a German Shepherd, this is whatever it is. You would have to tell them what they look like, what different poses they have, and you would have to do all this work to be able to let this simple machine who doesn't interpret anything be able to do that kind of work for you, that you would want to see the difference between a wolf and a dog. The difference with AI is that it is a probabilistic flow where the way we are now able to expose that data to an AI engine is that that AI is actually able to make sense of that data themselves. And they do this because we give them training data. And when we give them training data, 
the system itself is able to build layers of differentiation, and you can see that on the slide, where it looks for really fine details and then zooms out all the time to build different layers. And at the end of the day, what that system will tell you is a probabilistic answer. It will tell you there is a 90% likelihood that this is a dog and there's a 10% likelihood that that's a wolf. Now, that doesn't mean that this is a binary thing, right? It is literally a probability. And this is how you need to start thinking about AI when you design business processes. The output of AI will always be a, this is a probability thing. There is a 99% probability that that is a car, and that is exactly why an autonomous system is able to deal with that. But when we get to situations of that the model itself or the data isn't yet strong enough and gives you probability of 60 to 70%, that's not a given factor. There's a 30 to 40% that it's something else. And you need to think about that, how you design your processes to deal with, it, with either outcome. Because if you let technology learn, you need to also give it the space to actually do something with the, uh, with the outcome. And I say wolf and dog, and you think, well, that's pretty obvious, right? And it's not that obvious. I mean, here's an example of a chihuahua and a muffin. And you think that these two things are different things. I can eat one. Well, technically, you could eat the chihuahua as well, but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but you could eat one, and the other one is a dog that you could play with and is very cute. And then look at this picture and tell me what you think. <laughs> right? I mean, I had to look really hard and say, like, wait a minute, that... Oh, no, that is a muffin, right? So that's... It, it sounds so obvious, and it really isn't, right? And we bring all of this contextual information that our fantastic brain allows us to do. But for the computer, <laughs> That's really difficult. Uh, and this is why AI kind of uses that layered information that allows it to do this and is, is able to really make the difference between, I, I don't know in, in which situation you would even be confused by a chihuahua and a muffin, which business process that would be, but hey, you know, you never know. So probability, right? That is what, what AI uh, does for you. And again, here's another example, not just about object recognition, but for instance, also emotional recognition, right? So this is a system that if you, where is it there? It tells you that this person on the right has a 99% probability that he is surprised. And this is because the AI system has learned how to understand the facial, the facial, system, the facial uh, expression of different emotions. And in this case, that is a surprise. And it's really fascinating to see that uh, in play. I mean, here's an example of, uh, of myself uh, from a while back. And I was obviously very impressed, as you can see. I'm very happy. I'm like, wow, this is so cool. And my colleague, obviously, was very confused about what was going on. He has a mix of anger and sadness, even. I'm like, what is, what is going on here? Uh, but again, but you can see here as well, Another example that it's not if this or that, right? There is a probability going on. And in this case, it was a very high probability of me being happy. But my colleague has a lot of other things going on as well. And again, you need to think about what do you do in that situation? So there is a way to design for all of these different outcomes. And, and in, in a way, that allows us to be very much more personalized, much more tailored as well to create experiences that are unique for, uh, for individuals. So the other question that we hear a lot is, is, is AI a threat? Is that going to take away all of the jobs? And are we going to end up having to live at the mercy of the machines, right? And I just want to give you a short historical example of why I think that's not going to happen. Uh, and this is the example of the introduction of the automated teller machine, the ATM, the, the, the cash machine. So this is what happened with the amount of bank tellers, so the frontline bank employees, at the time that the ATM was introduced in, in the States. And what you see is that initially, after the initial introduction, you see that the, the human line slows down a bit, but then it actually goes back up again. And this is all because, not that they're doing the same work anymore, no. The bank teller, the human bank teller, now isn't giving out money anymore, but has been able to actually go upwards in the value chain and has been able to do things for customers that are actually more valuable. So it's not that that is a replacement thing if we do this well, and again, if the purpose of the bank here is to provide better financial services, then this kind of automation allows you to actually use more people to give a better, better experience to, uh, to customers. And that experience, I think, is very interesting because, again, that same research that we did showed that four out of five companies in Central and Eastern Europe showed that um, improving the customer experience, which, if you think about it, the customer experience is really the translation of the purpose of a company because that's what you need to feel, right? I, if I drive a Volvo, I need to feel that its intent is to keep me safe, right? Because that is what that company is out to do. And four out of five companies said, customer experience, that is why we want to uh, invest in digital transformation technology like, uh, like AI. And again, this is interesting because for most of you, I don't know how you guys see that, but when you think about um, 
using technology to improve customer experience, that hasn't always felt okay to me. I don't know uh, your experience, but when I have to go through an automated phone system and I have to press one for this, three for that, four for that, and then I forget and I have to go back to the beginning again, that improvement, that technology increase does not increase my, my customer experience, right? So that doesn't always happen. But the need is obviously there. I mean, if you look at it, 59% of customers, consumers, have felt that the, the companies that they interact with have basically lost the human touch. And again, this is back to the, the phone example that I showed. That kind of technology actually creates kind of a barrier between you as a company and, and you as a consumer. And it felt really distant. And I think with AI, we have the opportunity to actually flip that around. And like you saw in that video, make those experiences much more human. And this is, this is very important because also 58% of customers uh, believe that companies don't understand their needs. And again, here we have an opportunity to use that learning capability to get better at doing that and get better at providing it. And this is data that comes from Forrester. And if you're really looking at that's all fine and good, but what does that do for my bottom, uh, bottom line at the end of the day? Um, it, it also impacts that because there's the research that shows that companies that do well in customer experience, that really know how to bring that purpose, make it come to life and really bring that differentiated experience, they actually do much better when it comes from a growth uh, perspective as well. So there is a very much a financial uh, aspect here too. So with AI, what it allows you to do is to basically redesign the customer journey, redesign that process. And again, whether you are a travel company and it's about how do you help people make a booking, or whether you are a government institution, or whether you're a hospital and you think about how you design, let's say, the first aid process. How, how does someone come into the first aid room and how do you use technology to really redesign that, that experience? And I think there's three ways of going about doing that. I think there is some place where you could do more, right? And again, think about um, the example uh, before us with the automated tellers. But when you do more, it's like I can just reach out to more customers because I can use that kind of technology to make that, uh, make that easier, make that more scalable. And you basically do more of the same, but it's, it's the same. Oh, sorry, I need to go back. Um, the other one is do other. And that is actually uh, something to think about much more, where you can say, hey, with AI, I can actually automate a bunch of stuff. I can make it smarter. So I can start to do other things for my customer. I can do more useful things. Or you could say, I'm going to do exactly what I'm doing now, but I'm going to do it much better. I'm going to use all of my human capacity combined with AI to actually build that customer journey, but do it in a much better way and actually uh, create much more satisfaction. So when you think about AI application, there's a couple of patterns that we think are really the things that, where there's a lot of attention for today, and, and, and that makes, makes sense because they provide quite an opportunity. The first one is, and you've seen some of that in the video, is like con conversational. So instead of having to go through this phone system, press one for this, two for that, whatever, or having to fill out some form and then having to wait, you can now basically put together kind of a, a bot, a customer agent that is able to talk to you as a human being, understand what you need, and give you a tailored and customized uh, answer and help you to solve whatever it is that you were looking for, or even book. And we, in our kind of bot framework that we provide, we also see the possibility to have bots talk to each other, where you have your bot and say, look, can you talk to the bot of that hotel or whatever and make that booking for me? And you can do a lot of that stuff in the background as well. Another one that I think is really interesting is object detection. So think about a workplace, uh, a construction site with lots of heavy machinery. And because of the object detection capabilities of AI, we can see which tools are being used, which tools are lying around unattended, for instance, that could cause a safety concern. And we can actually respond to that much quicker because we can visually detect them. You can even go as far to connect them to the people that are using them. And you could even look at, do they have the right skill set to do that? Or is that going to create a potential uh, a safety issue there again? Now, what I one of the things I mentioned before, a hospital, this is already happening today, right? You see that what AI is really good at is pattern detection. So your doctor will be aided by AI, and they will give, for instance, uh, magnetic resonance imagery and, and, and able to find out tumors or whatever. And AI is really good at that. And there will be a human assessing the output before a final call is made. But that is something that we see a lot of uh, potential in as well. Knowledge mining, something else. You have an enormous amount of data and knowledge in your organization, but it's locked up in Word documents, even in paper documents. And again, you've seen how AI can help you make, uh, make more out of that as well. And finally, autonomous systems, which I talked about uh, already at the beginning. And here's an example of also how we as Microsoft use AI in, in our own kind of everyday 
productivity tools. Mm. And this is what you see here is Word. And Word has a, um, has a kind of a, a little bit of a sidebar there, which is the LinkedIn resume uh, assistant. So if you're building your resume in Word, you can now use AI that will look at LinkedIn and say, hey, what kind of resume are you trying to build? What kind of role are you trying to go for here? And it'll help you. It'll tell you, uh, like, hey, these kind of resumes for those roles, we see that this kind of structure and this kind of way of how you should bring your expertise forward, that's the best way to build up your resume, because that is the thing that makes, uh, makes um, the hiring company really, uh, really act on that. So again, using AI in everyday situations. And another example, this is also uh, an Hungarian example, is this is the Hungarian archive, where they have an enormous amount of photos, old documents, etc. And they want to you know, preserve that and make sure that, that that is digitized so we can save that for future generations. And this was a human process, where a human would look at the photo, classify it, file it away. Now with AI and with the kind of object uh, recognition that I showed you before, we can, we can automate that. And we can do that at a much, much faster scale. And again, a simple way of using AI to do something much faster. So let's maybe take a look at um, what, how you could rethink that customer experience, right? I, I've said you could redesign your customer experience based on the things that are important to you. I want to show you an example. It's another video about uh, um, a retail customer experience and how you can use AI to actually change the way that people shop today. Uh, you see some of that already is in play today. But I want you to also pay attention to some of the back-end information as well when it comes to uh, availability and, and delivery processes. So let's take a look at the video and see how we think you could, you could redo a retail customer journey. Now again. that back end that I was talking about. It does look much better in blue, I agree with that. So just a quick example, and you see a number of that, and obviously all of this, uh, as I'll mention later as well, needs to be done uh, within the proper setup, proper consent, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a lot possible to make that journey so much more personal, and also to make, for the retailer, it's so much easier to make sure that they have the right stock, that they optimize the back-end processes as well. Now, I mentioned we were talking, going to talk about tennis today. Um, and funnily enough, that guy on the left, Roger Federer, he will play this afternoon. Uh, against uh, uh, Nadal in the French Open today. And you also see someone cutting some, some ingredients, uh, a chef and someone playing, uh, playing the guitar. And th this is how you should think about AI. Make sense? <laughs> Probably not. Um, because what, but what they do have in common with us is that if you think about Roger Federer, Roger Federer, of course, is a giant in tennis. Um, and the way he plays tennis is he knows exactly what is possible within the combination of his body and, and the racket that he obviously uses. And because he knows so well what is possible, he's, allow, he, he's allowing himself to come up with solutions for, for scenarios that other tennis players just don't really see, actually. I mean, they, 
they did um, uh, eye tracking research on actually Roger, Roger Federer and Nadal, and they look at the ball differently than most other tennis players. And they're able to do that because they know so well what they can do with their body and with their, with their, um, with their racket. And if you're a chef, right, and you really know your ingredients very well, you can throw a bunch of ingredients together and you know exactly, like, that's going to work with this, that's going to work with this, so I can create a, a whole new recipe because I know so well how these, in, how these uh, um, um, ingredients are going to work together. Same with a guitar player, right? You could, in a jam, you could have that guitar player fill, up, fill in whatever they need to because he knows exactly how to use that instrument. And this is the kind of capability that uh, we all need to start thinking about when it comes to AI. Because the more fluent you are in knowing what is possible with AI, the easier it is to actually bring that into execution. And Roger Federer is an extreme example of that, obviously. But it's really about owning and, and being completely skilled in the art of the possible. That's a term that we use a lot when we sit down with, custom, with customers. Let's talk about the art of the possible. And these, all these roles are, are, in a way, not that different from you know, the opportunity we have, all of us, with, um, with AI as well. But what I hear a lot is that people say, like, oh, yeah, OK, I get it. But where do I start, and, and, and how, do you, how do you do this stuff? And I think a lot has to do with how we see the world. Um, and when you think about innovation in particular, right, there's often this idea that innovation is only done by, um, by people like you know, Elon Musk and, and Steve Jobs and like the big iconic innovators of our time. And, and that's true, but I think the way that people see the world, you could, you could categorize this in many different ways, but ultimately I think it's, it's two ways. On the one hand, you have these people like Steve Jobs, etc., and they will have a really good view at what is out there. They can see way further than anybody else with total sharpness, and they, they have that vision of what they want to achieve. Uh, and those are obviously uh, the visionaries. And then you have people, if you keep it super simple, that may not be able to see that far. They may not have that vision, but they have great clarity on what's, what's in front of them. They know exactly what they're working on today. They know exactly how this process works. They know exactly how they're doing their job today, and they know very well what opportunities there are to make an immediate improvement on the things that they're working on today. And you can think about these people as pragmatists. Now, I haven't done kind of the, um, the official kind of science on this, but in my experience, I think the division between the two is something like this. I think there are you know, not that many, obviously, on the visionary side, and most of us are, I think, pragmatists. Right? We can see improvement very clearly up to a point, and after that, we, you know, we don't have that grand vision, maybe. But that doesn't mean that it excludes us from, from innovation. And I find innovation really kind of an overused term and used in a very narrow way. And even if you think about the way the EU looks at innovation, I always find it doesn't do justice to what I see happening every day in, in Eastern Europe. I mean, here's, for instance, a, a, a ranking of the countries in, uh, uh, in, in Europe based on their innovation uh, execution. And you see that most... Um, uh, Eastern European countries are on the lower side of that scale. And I fundamentally disagree with that, because I see innovation happening every day. But it, it, it may be more in front of us. There may be some visionaries out there. But both is innovation. And for both, it's about can you think above and beyond how things are happening today, whether you do that at the Steve Jobs scale or whether you do that for your own, for your own work, for your own business processes. And that all comes down to imagination. And I think, and this is a quote, it's a little older already, but I think it's super spot on. Like, so many people are struggling to grow because they can't see beyond what they're selling today, or they can't see beyond how they're serving citizens today. It is literally about, well, this is what the process is, and that's what I'm going to go do. And I think, again, when you think about that whole dance thing at the beginning, the way that technology is now allowing us to rethink that is an opportunity we should not let, uh, let go to waste. And this is also confirmed by, for instance, the World Economic Forum. It's no surprise that if you think about what skill sets do we need to be successful going forward, and this is from a little bit further back, but it's very true today. And you see, for instance, that creativity uh, was ranked at, let's say, 10, so it's not unimportant. But when you think about going forward, it's already up there, right? It's one of the most important things out there. And again, that doesn't mean you have to be that grand, uh, amazing innovator, uh, but you can apply creativity today and you can do, you can start making some of those improvements like that logistics company or that archive uh, of Hungary that I showed to you uh, today. So it doesn't really matter how you look at the world, innovation is everywhere. And it's also not, and I want to stress this as well, especially when it comes to AI, it's also not how much money you throw at something, right? If you look at uh, the difference 
uh, again, between digital leaders, uh, this is a classification uh, of how technology is being used to enable uh, the customer experience, revenue, all that kind of stuff, and digital laggards. And you see, like, what is the difference in how much money they spend on technology? You see, it's not that different. Yes, it's, it's a little higher, but it's not dramatically higher. And that just means that because of the culture in the company, because of the way that they are allowing themselves to rethink processes, to rethink with imagination, you can actually achieve uh, a lot more. And this is not easy, right? And one of the things that, why this is not easy is, this is um, a short video from uh, a really nice movie. It's a, a movie, I actually forgot the title, but it's a movie made after the, uh, uh, the real life uh, um, uh, example of a, a French, um, uh, how do you, God, now I lost the name for a uh, tightrope walker, sorry. A French tightrope walker who, when the, the World Trade Center was still standing in New York, he basically went up there illegally and put that thing across uh, the two towers and did that amazing walk um, uh, across the two towers, which is amazing. But when you think about it, when you, in your everyday lives, whether it's in your company or in, in, in different organizations, you're doing tightrope walking all the time, right? Because it's really hard to basically combine those two things. And basically, you're, what you're trying to do all the time is to say, I need to balance continuity, because I need to deliver today. I don't have time to kind of sit down and rethink all of my processes and just take a whole year to figure that out, and then I'll go back to work. It doesn't work like that. You need to do that now. And at the same time, you need to counterweight that with the innovation you want to go do, and you want to make sure that there is a balance there. And as you get better with it, you will see that the things that you do in innovation, they start to kind of flow into your everyday systems and you start to maintain that balance, but you keep adding new stuff in it. And that is a mindset that we need to really think about. It's no longer, let's you know, think about stuff to improve once every couple of years, we'll do a strategy retreat, and then we'll figure it out. Uh, those days are over, especially when you use AI. You need to do this every single day. And again, the world changes, data changes, and that means that you need to kind of make sure that your organization is set up to do this ongoingly. And we think it makes sense to think about this in the way like a maturity model. Um, we have a maturity model out there that helps you to understand, so where are you today with your organization? And are you capable of doing that kind of work? And you could think about it in a way that if you're low on that maturity level and data is not yet in your culture, you're not a data-driven decision culture yet, if you then throw all kinds of technology at it, it's very likely not going to work. And you need to do a lot of work on the culture side, and you need to take small steps to kind of get going so you also don't lose that balance on that tightrope. And when, you, when we do this maturity assessment with our customers, we basically look at four things. And if you'll notice, three of those, actually three and a half actually of those, have nothing to do with technology. Right? It's about how you set up your strategy, how you set up your culture, how do you make sure that you design your organization to take advantage of technology, and then at some point, yes, we have to talk about the capabilities. But it's much more about the softer side of things, so to speak, that makes companies successful with, uh, with, AI, with AI. And once you've been able to do that, you can start to kind of build up, uh, let, let's say, a flow between the products that you build, the services that you do, the people that work for you, and how well they're able to do that work. And you can see all these different signals coming in and start to really build uh, a way to connect the dots there. So one kind of final point on, uh, on, on data. So great AI needs great data. And when you think about AI itself, it's basically built out of the underlying, the machine learning element of it. It has three, three modes. One is the AI engine. We recommend you to not build that for yourself. That really doesn't make any sense. It's too expensive. There's plenty of options out there in the market. We provide an AI engine. But the things you need to focus on is on the models and is on the training data. And again, like I showed you with the uh, with the Chihuahua and the dogs, training data is actually really important. But there is bias in data. And I'll give you one example, not two. What you see here on the left is the uh, kind of bombers that the, the US used during World War II to basically do bombings in, uh, in, in Germany. And they had a team of mathematicians work for the army to figure out all kinds of things. But one of the things they, they wanted to look at is how can we make the these planes better at kind of coming back, because if they get shot at all the time, you know, we lose a lot of people, we lose a lot of stuff. So they analyzed all of these planes that came back when they were full with bullet holes, and they figured out, where do I need to put the armor? So they, and the obvious reason was, the obvious logic was, well, let's see where the bullet holes are, and we put the armor right there. And one of the mathematicians said, 
No, no, <laughs> that's, that's obviously wrong. You need to put the armor where there aren't any bullet holes because probably the planes that have been shot in those areas didn't make it back, they actually went down. So you need to kind of think about that sometimes in your data, there could also be a bias of missing data. In this case, the absence of something was much more important than the presence of something. So they actually put all that armor into the places where there was no bullet holes, and they dramatically increased the amount of planes that came back from their missions. So again, bias is very, very, very important. So you need to start thinking about how you model your world, how you use that data to make it work for you. And you need to start thinking about how is that model going to reflect your purpose and how is that going to reflect your differentiation. Are you going to be the organization that is going to stand out because you're the fastest? Are you going to be the organization that stands out because you're the cheapest? Or you deliver the best customer experience? Those all would require a different kind of model, a different kind of training data, and a different kind of way of how you operationalize that. There's a great example from, uh, from Ukraine here, let's say the Uber of Ukraine, who uses AI, and they really wanted to focus on making sure that their drivers had, had enough capacity and improving customer experience. And that's how they built their model, and that's also what they were able to, to do, because they were able to drive the bookings in a way that, that had customer experience at the, at the front of that. Now, my final point. AI is, has a tremendous opportunity for all of us, um, but we do need to think about also how we do that in a responsible way. Technology always is neutral, but the way we think about it and the way we do it, um, we can also kind of abuse certain technologies. And we have a very strong point of view on that. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, we also wrote uh, a book on how we see the role of AI, and we're working very close together with governments, and we're urging governments to also think about regulation much more to make sure that AI is used in a safe, uh, in a safe manner. So if you walk away with, everything, with anything from today, I'd love for you to go and look at this. Um, next to um, the responsible and, and the trust factor of AI, and I really believe that trust is going to be a currency going forward, that other thing, that Roger Federer point, right, about how you can be skilled in what AI can do and how you can then use that in your organization, we feel super passionate about that. And we have an AI school that is available for everybody online where you can, if you're a technical person, we have deep technical content about machine learning and all those things. But if you're a regular <laughs> person, you're a business maker, you're a government leader, we also have an AI business school that really talks about the application of AI and you can learn how you can get the most out of that. And again, if you take anything away, go look at that, uh, at that stuff because I think that is a great piece of content for you, uh, for you here. So with that, determine that maturity for your organization. Think about your manifesto. What do I want to achieve? What is my purpose? And how can AI really unlock that? And with that, I think um, you can do whatever you want to. And with that, thank you so much for listening and I wish you a great rest of the day.